Uh, my topic is uh, low shrinkage UHPC, and I want to start by what gets me out of bed in the morning. And those of you who heard me speak before have probably seen this slide, but I'm very passionate about building sustainable infrastructure for society. It's the infrastructure that provides our quality of life, clean water, sanitation, the movement and housing of goods and people. And uh, what better material to build sustainable infrastructure than concrete and, of course, UHPC. So that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's what motivates me. Um, and so I want, to, I want to start off by talking about UHPC at the macro level. And I'm going to move into the micro, down into the nano level, and then back up and end at the micro, macro level. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about UHPC a little bit, and particularly uh, UHPC containing carbon nanofiber. And then I will uh, go in a little bit into the nanophysics of shrinkage. Then I'm going to talk about some of the important uh, properties uh, where we need low shrinkage UHPC. And then I'm going to show a project example of some of the shrinkage properties of UHPC on a specific project. So what is UHPC? I'm pretty sure everybody in this room knows what UHPC is. Is there, is there anybody who doesn't know what UHPC is? I'm sure that after the years and years of presentations at, uh, at ACI and other conferences, pretty much uh, everybody knows it's a cementitious material um, that uh, is a composite uh, with enhanced strength, durability, ductility compared to, uh, to uh, high performance concretes. And UHPC normally contain fibers, don't always have to, you can use other, other ways of uh, incurring uh, ductility, but generally they contain fibers discrete fibers, minimum compressive strength of 17,000 PSI at 28 days, modified uh, particle packing uh, with uh, coarse aggregates, typically less than 0.6 millimeters, sometimes it can be larger. Um, I, wanna, I wanna focus a little bit more on what carbon nanofiber does for UHPC, part particularly fresh and hardened properties, and obviously hardened properties when we talk about shrinkage. Uh, during the early hydration process, the carbon nanofibers actually cross-link the calcium ions uh, to have a higher water retention, and, and you uh, can extend the working time. Uh, it holds the fluid better uh, in the matrix, uh, in the fresh properties. It regulates that hydration uh, into uh, shaped hydration products, creating a final nano-engineered uh, dense interstitial microstructure. Uh, the more uniform hydration also reduces the differential stresses and, and it helps to facilitate higher early strength in the material. Um, on the hardened properties, it actually densifies that interstitial zone next to the aggregate, the sand particle, or in the case of a microfiber. It'll densify that interstitial zone uh, and cause a higher bond uh, to the fiber, or to, the, to the steel fiber, microfiber, or to the sand particle. And, and that, in, in turn, um, creates a better bond, a higher pull-up capacity. The other thing is that all cracks originate at the nano molecular or nanoscale. So as the concrete is put into tension, the nanofibers bridge the nano cracking, delaying the onset of, of nano cracks, which grow into micro and eventually macro cracks. So you, in fact, you increase the, the Young's modulus or, or the first, sorry, the first crack modulus of rupture uh, with, with the carbon nanofiber in the matrix. And you also, since you're increasing the bond to the microfiber, you increase the ultimate tensile capacity. But I want to talk about shrinkage. Um, <clears throat> and so I show here a graph of drying shrinkage at 90 days. And the drying shrinkage with a, a carbon nanofiber UHPC is about 360 uh, microstrain at 90 days, which is about half of a typical UHPC. Now I say typical because not all UHPCs are the same. It's a family of products. So you need to look at you know the individual materials and products and find out what the properties are. But on, on, if you look at the published data on uh, you know typical UHPC, you'll find it's it's more than double uh, 360 microstrain at 90 days. So the carbon nanofiber actually reduced uh, the shrinkage, the drying shrinkage. So what is carbon nanofiber? Well, it's carbon, uh, just like coal and diamond are carbon and they have a different microstructure, and so does carbon nanofiber. Carbon nanofiber is basically a 2D honeycomb microstructure, and they can be in the form of a tube or a fiber, 
you know, hence sometimes it's called carbon nanofiber, nanotube, uh, and it has to do with the formation of, of the 2D honeycomb material. And on the far right, you'll see a carbon nanofiber uh, using a, trans, a transmission electron microscope. It's about 50 nanometers in diameter, 150 millimeter, uh, nanometers in length. So we actually pump carbon vapor into a reactor with catalyst, and we convert that uh, to carbon carbon nanofiber, which comes out the end of the reactor. And it's actually a black dust. So if you grab a handful and blow it into the air, it disappears before your eyes. It's so small, it's nano size. We take that nanofiber uh, particle black, black dust, and we mix it with uh, chemical admixtures, uh, dispersants, antifoamant in a high shear mixer, and we make a black paste. And so that black paste is put into a pail and that's shipped to the project to, uh, to depending on, on the size and batch size and what's required for a given project. So I want to I wanna get into a little bit uh, closer look at the actual nano, nano mechanics of what goes on, goes on in terms of drying shrinkage. So in, in the top left is a, is a backscatter scanning electron micrograph of a polished cement paste surface. The black voids are the capillary pores or air, whereas the white is an unhydrated cement grain and the gray is a CSH gel. Across the bottom is a schematic of the CSH gel. So the blue in the, in the uh, schematic is water. Uh, the mesh is an interlayer space, which is dry. And the black line is a calcium oxide layer. And then the red triangles are, are the silica oxide. Um, first, I want to define the spaces available for water in the matrix. Um, we could call this the micro poromechanical framework for shrinkage, but I won't. Inner layer water spaces um, of less than one nanometer uh, reside between the silica rich layers of the solid CSH, which are the black lines. This is water at the molecular level, uh, and a water molecule is about 0.27 nanometers in diameter or across. And a chloride ion, for your information, is 0.37 nanometers. It's actually bigger than a water molecule. Uh, and the inner layer water evaporates only when relative humidity is less than 20%. So all the water in the inner layers in normal environment is static or stable. It does not evaporate or contribute to shrinkage or, or moisture volume changes in, in the uh, matrix. The, uh, the water in the gel pores is, between, is in spaces between one and 10 nanometers across. Uh, and these gel pores are normally the smallest pores possibly formed in the paste during the hydration process, and they're filled with the reaction products during the hydration. Um, and water in the capillary pores, which is outside this uh, schematic you'll see on the left, um, are basically in pores sizes of great, greater than 100 nanometers, uh, and they do not completely fill with water. Uh, and typically in, in UHBC, since there's no bleed water, you don't get these, uh, these large capillary pores. So these normally don't exist in UHBC. Um, and it's only these pore sizes that are greater than 100 nanometers that actually facilitate the moisture change during wetting and drying in the process. Uh, so the surface absorbed water in the empty pores is the water that's present that actually contributes to the shrinkage. So what goes in and out of the gel pore is what affects your, your shrinkage and swelling. So if you're in an environment that's greater than 20% relative humidity, which is most normal unless you're in the desert, uh, then it's really the water in the uh, capillary pores that we have to look at in terms of determining the drying shrinkage. <clears throat> so the carbon nanofibers, uh, in every cubic yard of uh, UHPC that we supply, there's about five times, uh, five quintillion carbon nanofibers. That's five times 10 to the 18th carbon nanofibers. So there's one carbon nanofiber, more or less around every cement particle in the mix. And these, um, these uh, carbon nanofibers act as nucleation sites during the hydration, and they cross-link the CSH with the calcium uh, hydroxide to provide a chemical bond. And it's how the carbon nanofibers are manufactured when we're making them that ensures that you have a good bond between the uh, CSH and the calcium hydroxide. So here we have a uh, transmission electron microscope of a um, <clears throat> of uh, CSH, and you'll see that uh, the slide on the left has a more granular looking inter interstitial zone next to the, uh, the CSH. Um, 
and on the right you'll see it's uh, more uniform. And in actual fact, the the uh, the UHPC paste without the carbon nanofiber is more granular, more porous, whereas you get the densification at the inner virtual zone uh, as shown on the uh, image on the, on the right. And here we have a an atomic force microscopy image of a CNF completely coated with the products of hydration. And the picture on the right is really a polished image of the same of the same uh, carbon nanofiber uh, in the paste. So here's here's the the, the slide that I like the best, um, and this is a high angular high angle ang annular dark field scanning tra transition electron microscope, which is a mouthful to say. Um, and this image basically shows uh, a carbon nanofiber in a, in a pore. So the black is air or pore, and the white is the uh, is the C3S or CSH, and um, and you can see the, the light gray carbon nanofiber that's bridging the pore. It's actually chemically linked uh, to the matrix on either side of the pore. So it actually resists the shrinkage when the pore empties out of the moisture. Just like when you think about reinforced concrete, you have a rebar that resists the shrinkage at the macro level, and you put a steel fiber in UHPC, and it resists the shrinkage at the micro level. When you put a carbon nanofiber in, it does the same thing. It resists the shrinkage at the nanoscale. Okay, uh, I want to talk a little bit about an application. And some of the applications where uh, low shrinkage is important in UHPC, of course, any place that UHPC or concrete is restrained, low shrinkage is important. So in the case of overlays, we want to minimize the shrinkage. Uh, if, you're, if you're jacketing anything that has a core, uh, anything that's restrained where the UHPC is surrounding it, uh, you will consume uh, tensile capacity of the matrix due to shrinkage. So the less shrinkage, the more residual tensile capacity you have to use in your structural design or strengthening of your structure. Okay, I want to look at an overlay project as an example. And I picked this project because this is a project where it was a part of a 10-mile road closure and there were multiple bridges and a lot of asphalt work to be done on the whole project so it was shut down for an entire construction season so we're able to go back periodically and inspect the bridge uh, very closely without being concerned about traffic or, or whatnot so this particular bridge is a single span side-by-side -side box girder bridge simply supported with a, with concrete approach slabs on either end so they went in and they milled off an inch and a half of concrete and we were put back an inch and three quarter overlay, and then we ground and groove uh, a quarter inch off, so you end up with a net of an inch and a half back on top of the bridge, so there's no change in the dead load on the structure. Um, this is also simply supported, but when we ran the overlay, we ran it from end of approach slab to end of approach slab, so across the abutment, which was designed to be simply supported, we continued the UHPC across there. So now we've built some negative moment capacity into the bridge, and we can only hope that there's enough strength in that UHPC over that negative bending moment region to resist that uh, tension when the bridge is loaded. So uh, on the right is basically after the hydro demo. So they milled off an inch and a half. Then they ran a hydro demo to remove any of the deteriorated concrete. Uh, and you end up with kind of a moonscape texture. Put on some uh, burlap for saturated surface dry to get the, the dampness and moisture on the deck before we cast the overlay. And then we started casting the overlay, so batching it and transporting it down with some buggies. And we used a simple uh, pneumatic uh, vibratory truss screed uh, to consolidate the material. It's a thixotropic mix, meaning it needs energy to, to fluidize. Uh, consolidated it. And then once it was placed and consolidated, spray curing compound, so white pigmented curing compound. There's no bleed water, so it's very important to get the uh, curing started immediately. Uh, and then after the material takes the initial set, we put a polyethylene down to further uh, protect it. And I get a lot of questions about, well, doesn't the curing compound do a good enough job? And the answer is no. When I go back the following morning and look, there's a lot of condensation under that polyethylene. So it tells me that the curing compound is not 100% perfect and there is moisture escaping. And since there is no bleed water and we want to make sure that we, we minimize the shrinkage, it's important to keep that moisture in the material, so we use the polyethylene. Uh, once it reaches about 10,000 PSI, we'll remove the polyethylene. 
Uh, and you see the surface on the left is after the polyethylene came off. And then at about 14,000, they'll go in and grind and groove the deck, and you can see the profile there uh, on the right. So I went back to this particular project, and like I mentioned before, the reason this project is interesting is because we had access to it on an extended period uh, during the process. And because the, the bridge was closed along with the rest of the road for an extended period, and they had other bridges they were doing PPC overlays on, they waited until all the bridges were done, and then they went in and did the grinding and grooving. So I happened to be back in the area at about 38 days after it was placed, and it happened to be the morning after we had some rain during the night. The sun came out, and it's perfect environment for doing a crack inspection because any of the rain during the night would migrate into the cracks. When the sun came out, it evaporated all the surface water, and you have a white surface. So every crack will show up as a black line on the, on the deck. So I was able to walk this deck back and forth, up and down every side, and there were zero cracks on the deck. Um, so that was, that was a good proof for me about the, the amount of shrinkage that actually occurred, which was quite minimal. Then I was able to go back about 90 days after the overlay was placed. It was just shortly after they had done the grinding and grooving. So the picture on the left is a picture of the profile after the grinding and grooving at 90 days. And the next picture over is, is a close-up of the surface. And again, I walked that bridge, crisscrossed it. Uh, no evidence of any cracking. Obviously, it's a little more difficult to see cracking on, on a bridge that got a lot of grinding and grooving. But there was no evidence anywhere. Uh, and then we were very fortunate we went back a year later and did the bridge on the other side where they had the other side of the interstate shut down. Uh, and so while I was there, I was able to go back and, and do an inspection on the bridge we did the year before. And so the two folders on the right, I tried to get something that's about the same spot as the ones on the left. So this is after one year of service. It was almost 365 days to the day. And the only difference you can see in the two is the one on the right has a little bit of rusting browning to the surface because when you grind those uh, decks, you expose the end of the fibers and you get some corrosion at the end. Uh, so there's a little bit of a brown color tint, but again, no cracks on the deck. Now, I should point out that over the abutment, where we ran the overlay over in the negative bending moment region, the new negative bending moment region, uh, I could not see any cracks visually. But I was on this bridge several days, uh, and one morning we came in after a rain, and I walked it again to check because I wanted to check over the abutment, and I could see a little bit of micro cracking over the abutments, which you would expect. So basically, um, there were no visual signs with the caveat over the negative bending uh, region.